Yeah, and and you know, uh, just along this, this is how we meander. This is how we think and how we bounce off each other. And it's it's so cool to do that with you. But as you were talking about ads on TV, one of the things that and I've got a PhD. I've I can use big words. There are pharmaceutical drugs uh, being advertised on TV right now that have so many unpronounceable words in them that it's impossible for even someone like myself to really articulate efficiently the name of the drug. Now. They're all end in AB, and that means that they're monoclonal antibodies. And monoclonal antibodies, in large part, some of them are cancer, which is fine, but in large part are directed against autoimmune disease, psoriasis, skin disorders, uh, and they suppress the immune system. They target a very specific seg uh, uh, segment of the immune system. Now, immune system is there, ideally, uh, with a proper human diet to protect us, but we were talking about uh, uh, Hashimoto's and, and thyroid disease. 82% of the women that come into my practice as new patients are on a thyroid medication. It is absolutely astronomical. So um, the amount of autoimmune disease that we see increasing massively in our population, and I would put type 2 diabetes as somewhat of an autoimmune or pro-inflammatory disease, be that as it may, um, that almost all of them, are triggered very heavily, if not primarily caused by our diet, by the yeah. industrial diet that we eat. And in an industrial era, we're eating that industrial diet that is manufactured processed foods, combinations of high carbohydrates and polyunsaturated fatty acids, which is a double hit. Then you throw in some salt there and uh, that's the paradox of salt. But now we're seeing all these monoclonal antibodies re being required to treat the autoimmune disease that comes from our diet. Just like on the ADA website, we've got 99 drugs, 99 medications, I think as of April, on the ADA website, I counted them, for the treatment of diabetes, mostly type two, which is a perfectly reversible diet with no medication, just stop doing, consuming, in my opinion, the drug that causes it, which is sugar and starch. So I, that was just something that triggered in my head when you were talking about ads on TV. Yep. And I think I think the analogy of, of fertility applies to that uh, argument as well. So if you're if your body fat percentage is too low, you're in, you're not going to be fertile. If your body fat percentage is too high, you're not going to be fertile. Right. There's a sweet spot. And when it comes to the human immune system, which is still largely not understood by medical and experimental science. There's so much we still have to learn about the human immune system, but it, it seems to be readily obvious that if your immune system is underactive, if it's weakened by your diet, then you're more susceptible to infection from viruses, bacteria, and fungi. If your immune system is confused, and a lot of doctors, the way they'll put it to their patients, and I think it's very improper to say it this way, they, they say things like, oh, your immune system is just too strong. We're going to have to put you on this uh, autoimmune medication to weaken your immune system. And that, to me, is, is borderline malpractice to say such a thing. That's so misleading. Uh, you, it, there's no such thing as an immune system that's too strong. But there is definitely a, a, such a thing as an immune system that is confused and overworked. And when you're eating an improper diet that's full of inflammatory crap, and, and, you, and as a result of that, you've got leaky gut and you're having full amino acids and in some cases, even full size proteins being able to slip through the tight junctions in the small intestine and go directly into the bloodstream. Your immune system's not too strong. Your immune system is confused as hell. That's what's wrong with your immune system. And that's why I think you and I have both seen so many thousands, if not tens of thousands of people now, when they start eating a proper human diet, keto, ketovore, carnivore, their immune system seemingly uh, becomes less confused. It seems to become less befuddled and it, it, it starts to recognize that, that very important barrier between self and non-self. It once again, and it stops attacking self and it, and it then only attacks non-self, which is what it's supposed to do. But when you're confusing it with a, with a diet that's just full of inflammatory crap, yeah, we're going to have an epidemic of infertility and we're going to have an epidemic of autoimmune diseases. And indeed, if you look at the medical literature, you can see that we're right in the middle of both of those. You're absolutely right. And I think the other way I look at the immune system is, for the most part, the immune system is designed 
to take care of acute problems immediately for a relatively short time. You cut yourself, um, your immune system responds and it heals. But if you keep scratching it or you get it infected and it just festers and festers and festers, or it's got a foreign body in it that stays there, it doesn't heal properly. And I think what we're doing with our diet is repetitive minor injuries. Every time we eat grain products, we're injuring that no mammal is can tolerate grain products, even cows. So um, we're damaging that immune system. Well, we're activating that immune system and damaging our tissues every time we eat, with every meal, with every snack, with every time we put stuff in our face. So it's a repetitive chronic injury that yes. then cross reacts in a repetitive and chronic way. So I don't call that an excessive response. Or it, the immune system is doing what it's supposed to do. You're just triggering it all the time, like continuously scratching a scab and picking your scabs. And we tell yeah. our kids all the time, don't do that. And there's a reason, but we do that with our nutrition. So uh, the immune system, as you said, is it's still very unexplored. And, and yet we don't know that much about it. We're learning more about it. But um, I, I do think that one of the largest triggers for our immune system is what we put in our face. Oh, 100%. I mean, we have more immune tissue, more immune cells in the gut than any other place in the body. And that's because that's where we are most intimately exposed to our environment, right? Human beings are just basically a, a long tube. That's what we are. If you, if you look at us schematically, we have an outside and we have an inside. And there's a, there's a hole at one end of the tube and a hole at the other end of the tube. And we all know what those are. But in the inside of that tube, we can be exposed to things in our, on our skin. We'll have a rash. We'll have an eruption. But we're exposed so much more intimately to our environment in our gut. And that's why we have such a preponderance of immune tissue and immune organs inside of our gut. And, and so you, you, you would have to think just logically, okay, that's where the majority of our immune response happens and comes from. So if we now have an epidemic of autoimmune diseases, probably, most likely, that's coming from something we're shoving in our mouth. And I think that's ex I think that logic holds true. I think that's exactly right. And that's why when you stop shoving slow poisons, inflammatory slow poison is what the standard American diet is. It does not kill you acutely because the corporation's attorneys won't allow them to market products that will kill you acutely because that increases the risk of lawsuits. But if it if it inflames you a little bit and kills you very slowly over 30, 40 years, there's not going to be a lawsuit. At least that's that's their thinking. I'm not so sure if they're completely accurate on that or not. We'll see what the future holds. But that, to me, that's an egregious behavior. But that's something that we're currently living with and we're all faced with on a daily basis, especially every time we go to the supermarket. Right. You, you know, and this is the beauty about, I just want to help people to drop inside my head for a second. As Ken's talking, as he's mentioning this tube, the, the commonest and earliest malfunction of our immune system at the earliest ages because of our diet, and this has happened, I fortunately, well, I avoided half, I, I had half done to me, half not, but kids certainly in our era, and I think still, are having their tonsils and adenoids ripped out so commonly that ENT surgeons make a living just doing T's and, T's and A's, and having eustachian tube and ear tube trouble. And in large part, the adenoids, the tonsils, which sit in the back of the throat, are entry point immune barriers to the stuff that we put in our face. And if you have a high carbohydrate, high grain, high immune activating diet, and we talked earlier on about the crap that Gerber and those companies sell, that is, in, to my mind, activating that into your body saying, hey, I've got to defend against this stuff. So of course your tonsils are big all the time. Of course yep. your station tubes where they enter the, uh, uh, the back of your throat swell up and you get ear infections. Uh, you know, my son has never had an ear infection. He's had or one mine. Colds, right? He's had one or two, two colds that I can think of that he picked up one from a babysitter and one from a flight on an airplane. Neither was yep. healthy, but he's been about as healthy as you can be. No tonsillitis. He's got a beautiful set of teeth. Now, I cannot but believe that that isn't related to his diet, but we're ripping tonsils and immune systems, defensive immune systems out of people, out of young kids, one, two, three, five years of age. And that impacts the rest of their lives. Because uh, nature and evolution put those, that, that, that immune system in place for a particular purpose.
Absolutely. Let me tell you a story, doctor. I was in Panama, uh, Central America, uh, speaking at a conference about two years ago. And after the conference, we all met up at a restaurant and the, the conference organizer, he had some of his friends there to meet me. And there was this young lady, she was in her 20s and she had her little baby with her. She couldn't find a sitter. And the poor baby, uh, being a doctor, people don't know this, but doctors can, we can see stuff across a restaurant. We can see pathology across a room. And it's it, sometimes we're like, I wish I could just turn that off because I don't want to be a doctor. I want to just be a dude, right? I could tell you, I'm going to talk to Poor them. baby was, was covered with eczema. Oh, okay. Man. This baby was a mouth breather. Uh, this baby had not breathed through his little nose in maybe ever, right? And babies still are born obligated nose breathers. Yes. And so I just, I went over and said hi to the mom, started talking to her. Thankfully, she spoke English. And uh, she said, can you please tell me, I've been to doc so many doctors with my baby, but nobody can clear up this eczema. And he's had tubes in his ears twice already. And I think he was two, two and a half, somewhere in there. He'd already had two sets of tubes put in his ears because of the chronic inflammation. And so I said, you, it's, it's the diet. I'm telling you, it's the diet. Okay. And she said, no, no, no. I feed him every, everything I feed him is natural and, and wholesome. And so she had her diaper bag and you know me, doctor, I, I, you know, I, I don't have much in the way of social graces. So I just reached over and grabbed her diaper bag and opened it up and started pulling stuff out. And the first thing I pulled out was the, the soy uh, formula. The next thing I pulled out was some little uh, rice crackers, right? And then I pulled out some animal crackers. And it, now, now let's, we got to break this down and think about this. This mother loved her child more than life itself. This mother was trying as hard as she could to do everything right. She had spent way more money than she could afford taking this baby to doctors and getting prescriptions and, and doing medical treatments. But her baby was still sick. And she did not understand. She was believing the, the advertising. She thought these things were wholesome. She thought these things were made for the optimal health of her baby. Because and the I doctor said, told her that and the packaging told her that. Absolutely. I, and I told her, I said, look, you're doing this to your own baby. I know you don't mean to, and I'm not being harsh, but you, you have to understand this stuff is poison. And she's like, well, nobody's ever told me that. What should I do? And so we had about a 10 minute discussion on what a proper human diet is in, uh, for a human of any age. I like that. Any age, any age. If you're four months old or if you're 114 years old, there is a species specific diet for you that if you do not eat it, you will get sick and you will suffer. And so we had this conversation. About three months later, I'm back home in Tennessee and somebody's trying to call me on Instagram, which is weird. Did you oh, know you can call people with like that. a telephone call? Yeah. And over and over and over. And I, I, I Googled the, the, the area code and it was a Panama number. And I thought maybe it's the event organizer. I don't know why he's calling me like this. So I answered it, which I never do. So don't call me on Instagram. I'm not going to answer it. But I answered it and it was this mother. And she, she wanted to, to FaceTime with me. And so we're video chatting. She said, I just wanted you to see my boy. And so she puts this child in, in front of the phone. And this does not look like the child that I saw in Panama. Wow. Just skim. I, I, give me a second. Sorry. She was, she was crying tears of joy. She said, why did somebody not tell me this? She said, this is all, and she was having a lot of guilt. And I, had, I was like, no, no, mm -mm. this is not your fault. But now you know better and now you can do better. But this looked like a different child, Rob, a different it, child. It, it, it is, you know, and, and I think I want, I want folks to see Ken Berry's face right now. Here's a guy who's treated tens of thousands of people. And yet he and I both get so passionate about the individual stories because it's, it is so wonderful to see somebody turn something around like this because they get the proper advice. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and I mean, it just, it, the emotional value that this brings to us as treating physicians. And, and it's just, you know, the other thing I'll tell you, that, uh, Ken, is this, that those pediatricians are deprived of the feeling you just showed because yeah. they're at their wit's end to treat this child. Now the child goes to the dermatologist, the child goes to the ENT doctor, the child gets biopsies, the child gets antibiotics, the child gets ear tubes. And yet 
they never experience the emotion that you just experienced of helping someone to correct a problem. That, and that, I know what that, that feels emotion. like, Doc, because the first, the first few years of my medical practice, I was that doctor. I was that doctor that would just keep writing prescriptions for this poor little baby that was congested and, and had repetitive ear infections and eczema. I would send them to dermatology. I would send them to ENT. I would, I would get the referral so they could get tubes in their ears. It's frustrating. It's depressing. No wonder that the suicide rate is so high among healthcare providers because it's, 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 it's defeating. It's just, it just destroys your soul because you went into medicine to help people and you're obviously, you're not helping a damn bit. All you're helping is the, the gears of the machine to keep spinning, but you're not helping that little boy at all. And that's that's why I went to medicine was to help that specific little boy, not to, to help this machine add another billion dollars in revenue. That's not why I was, I, I, I was called to be a doctor. And so, yeah, you're right. So many doctors, when we talk like we talk about the experiences we've had, we must sound like Martians to them because they're like, I think they think we're making this up. I think they think that's not possible. That's not real because if that were real, I would know about it because I'm a smart doctor and that shit never happens in my practice. So these guys must be full of shit. Well, and you know, not, I, I, just any healthcare providers watching this, we're not full of care. shit. No, we're not full of shit. We're telling you the truth. Told me. The author of lies my doctor told me. 